Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. Always glad to have with us on a Tuesday morning, Alfred University history professor, Dr. Gary Ostrauer. Uh, Dr. Ostrauer wanted to start out saying something about his friend, the late uh, Assemblyman John Hasper. Well, I knew John uh, quite well for some years, as a matter of fact. Uh, I had served as his Allegheny County uh, representative when John was a member of the New York State Assembly. And then, of course, after the Assembly, uh, he eventually became the Deputy Secretary of State in New York, uh, in New York State. Uh, he had a very, very distinguished and a very long uh, political career. He had a real sense of commitment, if you will, uh, to the public. Uh, uh, you know, we talk about public service. Uh, there's a lot of lip service that we give to public service, but John Hasper lived it. Uh, I might also add uh, that John Hasper helped to put together a coalition way back in 1990 and in 1991, about 30 years ago, that helped to prevent the state of New York from locating uh, a nuclear waste dump uh, in Allegheny County. There are a lot of people who are involved in that effort, uh, but every single week John would have a meeting in his office in Belfast uh, with a group of the leaders of the uh, coalition uh, in opposition to the dump. And he did not care about one's political uh, affiliation. Uh, he was one of those Republicans who understood fully that Democrats are loyal, that they are not disloyal in the way that they're being described today, often in Washington or whatnot. Uh, he was, I think, an exceptional human being uh, and an awfully dedicated public service and a servant, and I, I, I just regret his death. Dr. Ostro, we're on the uh, topic of uh, Iran, which is going to be uh, the, our show topic today for, the mo for most of it. Uh, President Trump um, has lost the support of uh, two major names, Tucker Carlson and Senator Rand Paul. Here's what Tucker Carlson said last night on Fox. And by the way, these are the same people. And he's talking about uh, Trump trusting uh the intelligence community in uh, the uh, information that Intel gave to Trump about uh, an upcoming attack against Americans. Here's what Tucker Carlson says about that. And by the way, these are the same people who lied about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction way back in 2002, and by doing that, got us into an utterly pointless war that dramatically weakened our country. The people pushing conflict with Iran are the same people who did that. It seems like about 20 minutes ago we were denouncing these very people as the deep state and pledging never to trust them again without verification. But now, for some reason, we do seem to trust them implicitly and completely. In fact, we believe whatever they tell us, no matter how outlandish, Iran did 9-11, they're telling us. Dr. Ostrauer. Well, I think that Tucker Carlson is, uh, you know, he has his own, uh, how shall I say, his own uh, bully pulpit there. Uh, I don't take very seriously what Tucker Carlson says. Uh, I think that there is something, of course, to the point he's making that on one level, uh, uh, the, President Trump was denouncing the so-called deep state, was denouncing the intelligence that we were getting from not only the CIA, but from 16 other American intelligence agencies. President Trump had indicated that he believed uh, the word of uh, uh, President Putin of Russia more than he did of all of the 17 American uh, intelligence agencies, and now supposedly uh, he's relying on this. We don't know what the intelligence agencies really said. As a matter of fact, we do not know that the intelligence agencies indicated that there would be a, quote, imminent attack on American personnel in the Middle East last week. Uh, maybe they did and maybe they did not. What we do know is that Trump has not offered one iota, not an iota of real evidence that there was going to be such an attack and, uh, you know, where the intelligence agency stood, uh, we're not going to know probably for a long, long time. But I do think that, you know, because we don't know what uh, the intelligence agency says, because we have not been offered any of these, this evidence, there's all the more reason to be skeptical of what President Trump is telling us. Was there going to be an imminent attack? And if there was, then why did we kill uh, the, you know, the, the, the leading military leader in Iran? I mean, normally, if there's going to be an attack, you go after the people who are going to attack you. Uh, uh, the killing of Salamini, 
uh, would, would that have any real effect on this? Would that somehow stop an attack? Uh, there's no reason to think that it would. In other words, it's just illogical. And I think more importantly, from my perspective, what this all points up is the incoherence of American policy. I have said on this program often that, you know, President Trump is not, you know, fit to be the president of the United States of America. And one of the reasons I believe he's not fit is because he is ignorant of history, he's ignorant of strategy, he is not a systematic thinker, he is erratic, he is dishonest, and I think that in many ways he just, you know, kind of acts on the basis of impulse. We had in the administration, when President Trump first became president, a number of people, including H.R. Uh, McMaster, General McMaster, General uh, Mattis, and so forth, a number of other people who are really very, very good policymakers, very, very thoughtful individuals. Every single one of them, without exception, of the people that I really respected, Every single one of them is now gone from this administration. So we've gone from the A team to now what we have, I guess, as a third team or maybe a fourth team, okay, people who I have no particular confidence in. And I would also mention, if I can, you know, just kind of add this one thing, the Secretary of Defense, probably very few people listening to this program right now can name the Secretary of Defense of the United States of America. His name is Mike Esper. We've not heard from him. We do not know what the American military is really thinking about this. They'll follow orders, and by golly, that's one of the, you know, one of the you know, critical components of the American system, that the military will accept civilian leadership. But, you know, we haven't heard from Esper. We've heard from Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, but the, uh, but the American military, the Defense Department, has been silent on this whole thing. And my hunch is that that silence reflects a, some, a very, very deep disagreement on the part of the military with what the United States did this past week. Here's what Senator Rand Paul said about um, who advised uh, uh, President Trump to do this. I think that he got bad advice. I think that basically, even though he let John Bolton go, this is John Bolton. John Bolton's clapping and jumping up and down and rubbing his hands together because this is what he wanted. So, Rand Paul's there. They're basically saying it's the spirit of John Bolton. Well, I think that's probably correct. But I think the spirit of John Bolton in this particular case may come directly not out of the president's advisors, but rather of the president's Oval Office. And I say that because apparently, and I say apparently because we still don't have all of the information that we would need. The military had given the president a series of alternatives in respect to a, uh, a response to the Iranians. Uh, that list of alternatives apparently included something between three and five different ways of responding. It could be a cyber response, it could be an economic response, it could be tighter sanctions, whatever it might be. There are a whole series of alternatives. And the last of these things, the very where, the one at the very, very bottom, the, was the most extreme, and that was the killing of the Iranian general, who of course was assassinated this past week. Now, President Trump went with the most extreme of these. And he rejected, if you will, the somewhat more moderate, uh, uh, the, the more moderate alternatives. Why did he do this? Okay, and I don't think it had much to do with his advisors. I think it had everything to do, perhaps, with one advisor, namely Secretary of State Pompeo, and maybe also with uh, a, a rather extreme vice president that he has, who has a kind of religious view of the Middle East. But I don't think that his other advisors were likely to have suggested that. So. Why did he do it? And I think that, you know, there are any number of different possibilities. One, of course, is the fact that, uh, you know, he acts on impulse. He, he wants to appear uh, uh, strong. He wants to appear tough. Uh, he doesn't want the uh, attack on the American embassy in, in Baghdad uh, to somehow be reflective of what happened in Benghazi a number of years ago. 
so, you know, he's taking this extreme measure, but he's taking an extreme measure without thinking through the consequences. You got to ask yourself, if you're a policymaker, if we do this, what are what will be the consequences? What are the what are the reactions? Uh, I was surprised, for instance, when Pompeo, when Secretary of State Pompeo said just a couple of days ago that he's disappointed in the re, in the European support that we're getting or the non support that we're getting from the Europeans, and yet President Trump has essentially undermined whatever support we are likely to get from the Europeans. He's withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord. He's withdrawn from the nuclear agreement with Iran. He has uh, uh, questioned the viability of NATO. He has insulted a number of NATO leaders, including the president of France, the president of uh, the, the, the prime minister of, uh, uh, of Canada, and so forth. Why, you might ask, would the Europeans support a president who has been so erratic, who has been so dishonest, and who has been so unreliable? So, you know, it just seems to me when I say that American policy is incoherent, that, uh, you know, he's making this into a virtue. Dr. Gary Ostra, our guest this morning on a Tuesday morning here in uh, January 2020. Uh, Dr. Ostra, what about the argument that uh, Trump had to respond to the U.S. embassy attack by the Iranians recently? Well, look, uh, uh, I think what you have in the Middle East is one of these tit-for-tat kinds of things. You've got one, one side, uh, uh, you know, make that act. Then you get a response from the other side. Then you get a response to the response. Then you get a response to the response to the response to the response and so forth. Uh, I heard just this morning uh, the, Iranian, uh, uh, the Iranian foreign minister had been interviewed, I think, by a CNN uh, correspondent. Uh, you know, and he laid all the blame on the United States. Well, I heard an interview just a few minutes ago right on WLEA uh, on Brian Deal's program with a, uh, a congressman from uh, Pennsylvania somehow, a Republican congressman, who was doing nothing more than, than, uh, than offering an uncritical uh, uh, defense of President Trump. And this congressman laid all of the blame, 100 percent of it, on the Iranians. So the Iranians are claiming that we are terrorists. We are claiming that they are terrorists. In the real world, in the real world, what's happened is a series of, 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 of events, each one which makes another you know, response more likely. And that's where escalation, I think, becomes a real threat, because eventually there may be miscalculation, there may be errors, there may be fears, okay, Whatever uh, you know, the, the, the motivation is, it leads to you know, more and more serious responses. Pre uh, Mike Pompeo said yesterday, I'm sorry, but on Sunday, on a number of radio programs, on TV programs, you know, all these, uh, uh, you know, the news programs uh, in the morning, five of them, I guess, he said that the United States is now safer than it was before the killing of General Salamini. Uh, you got to be, you, you have to be in outer space to be saying that kind of thing. You have to be in outer space if you believe that we are now safer. Uh, you know, if we're safer, then you got to ask, why has the American government asked every single non-essential American in Iraq to leave the country? Okay, if we are safer, then why has the administration added an additional 3,000 troops from the 82nd Airborne into the Middle East? If we are safer, why are we re repositioning our troops in the Middle East? And why, I might add, are we you know, diminishing the effort to contain ISIS in order to somehow you know, shore up our defense against Iran? We are not safer, and we're not going to be safer. The Iranians have claimed that they are going to respond in due time. I have no reason to think that they're not going to do that. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. We really don't. We don't know whether there's going to be a broader war. We don't know whether there's going to be just a, you know, very, very measured response by the Iranians. But we do know that this, you know, that what, what, what's happened this past week is simply the opening round of what's going to be a much more complicated and I think a much more dangerous situation for all Americans in the Middle East. 
We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment with Dr. Gary Ostrower. Have you written a book? You can become a published author with Dorrance Publishing, the nation's oldest publishing services company. Countless authors have trusted Dorrance for nearly 100 years to bring their book to the market. Our professional team will edit your text, design your book pages, and create an appealing, eye-catching custom cover. Plus, our authors benefit from a custom book promotion marketing campaign that makes your book available where people buy books, like Amazon and brick and mortar bookstores. So make this free call right now to claim your free author's guide to publishing. Don't wait another day. Take one step closer to realizing your dream of becoming a published author and seeing your name in print. You've already written a book, so the next thing to do is make this free call right now to Dorn's Publishing and get your free guide to publishing. Call right now. 800-482-8399 800-482-8399 That's 800-482-8399 Checking in now with uh, meteorologist Rob Carroll and says there's earthquakes in Puerto Rico and temperatures of 60 degrees coming up for our area over the weekend. First, let's, Rob, what's going on in Puerto Rico? Well, uh, since December uh, 28th, Brian, uh, it's been geologically active off the south coast of Puerto Rico. Yesterday, they had an earthquake over a magnitude 5.0. This morning, a 6.4 a magnitude earthquake uh, causing some damage across the south coast of Puerto Rico. Power is out on the island, and uh, there has been reports of damage as far east as Ponce. And they'll be uh, shaking for a couple more weeks now. Uh, Puerto Rico, actually, uh, about 120 years ago, was hit with a real strong earthquake at 7.3. So uh, kind of rough going down in Puerto Rico. Brian, we're also keeping a watch on some really mild weather that's headed our way. Temperatures by late in the week could be up close to 60 degrees. The January thaw is going to kick in before colder weather arrives this weekend. Now, today we've got lots of clouds headed our way. We'll call it mostly cloudy. We're 40 to 45. Sunrise this morning was at 739. The sun sets tonight at 453. Tonight we'll have clouds, a couple of snow showers or flurries are a possibility. 25 overnight up to an inch may fall by morning some more snow showers could produce an additional inch tomorrow it's breezy and cold 25 to 30 partly to mostly cloudy 10 to 15 tomorrow night partial sun breezy 30 to 35 thursday and then noticeably milder on friday brian we're with uh, dr gary ostrauer this morning who says you have to be in outer space to think we're safer than we were before the general was killed uh dr ostrauer um All kinds of uh, stories out. The Daily Beast has a story about uh, why uh, Obama and uh, George W. and uh, Netanyahu skipped over on uh, killing uh, the general. Um, There's also a report that Obama stepped in and tipped off General uh, Soleimani. And this is in Israeli newspapers and... um, Saudi or not Saudi, uh, Kuwaiti newspapers about uh, that happening in 2015 that uh, the Obama administration tipped him off. Uh, they think it was speculation that that was done in order to prevent uh, the Iranian deal from um, being interfered with. Your thoughts, Dr. Astor, on these, uh, I guess I'd say, side stories to the general's death? Look, I have no idea what whether Soleimani was tipped off at all in 2015. I do know that policymakers have to weigh the consequences, I said before. In other words, you know, no one should mourn, at least no one here should mourn the death of Soleimani. He was responsible, or he helped, you know, you know, create policies that led not only to the deaths of many, many Americans, but that continued, uh, you know, unrest, instability, terror action and whatnot in the Middle East for some years. Okay, he may have been a hero in Iran, but there's no reason to think that he should be a hero, uh, you know, on the part of any on the uh, part of any Americans. On the other hand, you know, you got to ask: Are the consequences worth it? What are the consequences of killing him? And are the advantages outweighing the disadvantages of killing him? And it seems to me that the uh, Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, as well as the Obama administration, had concluded that it was worth worse to assassinate him than not to assassinate him. And consequently, he was not assassinated. Okay, the Bush administration, not the Bush, I'm sorry, but the Trump administration has obviously come to a different conclusion. But, you know, when I say the Trump administration, I refer back to something I indicated before. I think this in many ways is President Trump's own. This is hardly an administration policy. It's kind of a personal policy. I think it's his way of appearing to be tough. But 
you know, there's a larger issue here, and it goes back to, you know, in some ways what Rand Paul was saying. What are the consequences? What happens? What are the advantages, okay? When we went into uh, uh, Iraq, for instance, when we started the war with Iraq in 2003, the expectation was that it was going to be a very, very short war, that Saddam Hussein would be uh, uh, overthrown in a relatively short period of time, that it would democratize the Middle East, that it would make the Middle East safe for American exports and whatnot. In other words, that there would be no or very, very few negative uh, consequences. In the reality, what happened? We lost 4,500 soldiers dead, killed in action, plus many, many, many others, about 30,000, who were wounded. There are about 500,000 Iraqis who wound up dead. It cost the United States, in dollar terms, about $2 trillion dollars that has permanently, you know, I think affected uh, our ability to balance the budget. I think that has weakened our economy generally. We know that our activity in Iraq has led to the rise of ISIS, okay, which has become not simply a you know, local organization, but, a, uh, uh, but an international organization. Uh, uh, it has uh, spread uh, uh, instability into the Middle East, in the Middle East, but also into northern and into eastern Africa, such as in Kenya, uh, such as in Somalia, as we saw this past weekend. In other words, there are a whole series of negative things, negative consequences, Consequences from that, not the least of which was the fact that Iran now has much, much more influence in Iraq than it did before 2003. In other words, the war turned out to be a disaster. It may have been the most serious error that American foreign policymakers have made since the year 1776. And I mean that when I, you know, make the point that I happen to be a diplomatic historian. Well. If we wind up going to war with Iran, which certainly I think people like Bolton and certainly people like Pompeo would support, we better understand that Iran is three times in population, three times in population the size of Iraq, that it has a much, much larger army, that it has proxy armies in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq. I'm talking about Hezbollah and other, some, uh, some of these other militias. It is very, very close to Saudi Arabia and can wreak havoc on Saudi Arabian oil facilities, something similar to what already happened a, few, uh, a couple of months ago. In other words, you know, we better understand what the consequences are. And I fear that President Bush, I keep saying President Bush, that President Trump has simply not thought this out, and I don't think he's capable of thinking it out. I think he's not a systematic thinker, and I think that he is someone who, even when his advisors, when his good advisors, you know, or, you know suggest certain of these consequences, uh, he tends to he tends to uh, he tends to ignore them. So I think we're in for a uh, for a difficult period. I hope I'm wrong about that, but uh, I'm not very optimistic. I wanted to ask you, Dr. Ostra, we're down to the last 60 seconds or so, and this is sort of uh, questioning my own judgment, I guess, and shows like this where we question the, a president after an incident like that. Are, I, I don't want to think that we're, you know, we don't have the signal, obviously, but, you know, could it, is it a bad idea to be criticizing a president after something like this when things are so tense? What do you think about that? I think that uh, if a president makes a move that is uh, against, that is contrary to the national interest, uh, it is we have every reason to uh, to question him publicly as well as to question him privately. I think that's one of the good things about having a country, living in a country where we still have freedom of speech and where we still have freedom of the press, in spite of the degree to which the president might wish that we could curtail that. Yeah, I, I always wonder about that in situations like this. Well, that we're out of with that we're out of time, Doctor Ostrauer. As always, uh, thanks for joining us. And if you could stay on the line, that'd be great. Thank you. There is no question who was behind.